Hello everyone and a warm welcome to our today's online education session. My name is Lena Goethel. I'm here together with uh, Dirk Goethel. We are here at the Riebelspine and Richard Wolf headquarter in Germany and it's a great pleasure to welcoming you today. So today we will have an expert session and we are very proud to have the today's uh, faculty with us. So um, we will really have today really advanced topics in full endoscopic spine surgery. And we would like also to invite you to discuss your questions directly with our faculty. So whenever you would like to bring up a question, please use the YouTube chat to put in your questions and afterwards our faculty will be pleased to discuss your questions directly. So um, now let me introduce you to the today's faculty. We are live connected to Japan, to Professor Sairo. He is professor and chairman of the Department of Orthopedics from the University of Tokushima. And uh, also we are live connected to Professor Christoph Siepe from the Schön Clinic in Munich. Hello and a warm welcome to you. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for joining today. Um, so today I think um, Professor Syro, we will start uh, with your um, presentation first. Would you like to say a, a warm welcome to the audience and maybe a few words from your side? Hi. Hello everybody. My name is Koichi Saido from Tokushima University, Japan. I'm a student of uh, Tony Young, Arizona, USA. I learned him uh, how to perform a transforaminal approach. So I'm doing 100% transforaminal surgery, discectomy, decompression, and fusion. Now, today, I'd like to introduce my uh, transforaminal full endoscopic fusion surgery. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Syro. I think that um, will be a very exciting topic, and I'm sure the audience will be very interesting to learn about your experience. And um, I would say um, we can start with the presentation. So please, um, please share your screen, and um, we will wait for a few minutes. OK. Okay. Yes, we can see it. We can see. It's okay. Okay, Hello, everybody. perfect. Let's start. Thank you. My name is Koichi Saido, a professor and chairman of the Department of Orthopedics, Tokushima University, Tokushima, Japan. So I'm a chairman of Japanese Society of Minimally Invasive Spine Surgery. Today, I'd like to talk on full endoscopic KDF. KDF means Transcambine triangle lumbar intervertebral fusion. This is my COI. First of all, I'd like to explain my phrase in Japan. This is a map of Japan. Uh, from north, there is a uh, Hokkaido Island. Yeah, this is Hokkaido Island, Honshu Main Island. It includes Tokyo, Osaka, and Kobe. And the southernmost island is Kyushu. Final small island is Shikoku Island. I'm here in Shikoku Island. And Tokushima is here in Shikoku Island. Most closest city is Kobe. And between my place, Tokushima, and Kobe, there is another small island. Between this island to Kobe, there is a beach. It's so beautiful, the name is Pearl Beach. And from my place, Tokushima, to the island, there's another bridge. Look at this. This is really dynamic, look strong bridge, Naruto Bridge. Please look closer underneath the bridge. You can see something. Yes, this is the biggest whale pool in the world. Please look at the size between the ferry boat and the whale pole. Yeah, it's like uh, bigger than the whale pole, so be careful. 
But if you do come visit me, I'd like to take, take you there. Okay, let's talk about history of German and my place, Naruto, Tsushima. Uh, there was a concentration camp after World War I in Naruto city. Um, Naruto people enjoy the German culture, food, music, sports, and so on. Please look at slides. You know, they are enjoying uh, uh, music from Germany. They, they also created a tennis field, or sometimes they are making like a gymnastics showing us. They also make uh, uh, made a house or like a, uh, to make a cake or bread. This, this is a European style. We are eating rice, not bread. So this time, at that time, the Naruto people really, really enjoy the German culture. And I'd like to emphasize that the first orchestra concert in Asia for Beethoven Symphonia Number no. 9 and the Freud was held here in Naruto on June 1st, 1918, Tokushima. This is the first concert in the Asia from the Naruto. But year after that, we had a ceremony, 100 year memorial concert and the Freud in also in Naruto. Tsushima in 2018, 3,000 people sang some, some, uh, some this song. And also we invited uh, 100 German students from Niedel uh, Sa Saxon city. Uh, maybe uh, I'm Tokushima University and Hanover University there, a great uh, sistership and we are sending uh, a couple of medical student to Hanover Medical College every year. In these 50 years, Naruto City has a great, great sister with a Lune Park. And we have now a Naruto Jama House and Memorial. Okay, let's move on to the today's topics. Uh, Park Tanya's intradiscal approach. I'd like to tell you uh, two great fathers. Professor Kambin, very famous as a Kambin safety triangle. But before he started the Kambin triangle angle, Professor Hijikata started park tennis nucleotomy using this triangle. And I'd like to uh, today talk about uh, his insertion through the Kambin triangle under the guidance of fluoroscopy. Please look at this yellow line. This is an uh, insertion point of the cage. This small skin incision, usually I'm making a 12 millimeter. We are inserting a cage under the guidance of fluoroscopy. Uh, I checked in the literature. I think uh, uh, in your country, Joey Max uh, proposed the name of endorif, endoscopic lumbar interbody fusion first. In Japan, there are two uh, frontiers. Dr. Nakamura proposed the name is Park Tennis Endoscopic Leaf. And Dr. Nagahama proposed Park Tennis Endoscopic T Leaf. Now we are using not Park Tennis in the world, we are using full endoscope, FE T Leaf, FE Leaf, and T Leaf, full end P T Leaf. So many surgeons are make, using uh, so many different names. Please think, procedure is similar. Everybody is using a endoscope. It's an interbody fusion. Cage insertion is through the Kambin triangle. So I propose the name is Calif. Look at this is a Kambin safety triangle. So I, <clears throat> I discussed the nomenclature of this procedure and finally I named Calif in 2019. And also, I think this is a, the journal is German, German, Germany, Journal of Neurological Surgery number A. Uh, I reported the initial 10 cases of KDF. And this year, this is a Korean journal, JMISST, 
I uh, wrote a review article for, for this uh, polydiscopic KDF. Look at this. This is the difference between KDF corridor and TDF corridor. TDF is, I think, KDF is started from Germany. Professor Harm started this surgery and he said he put inside the cage after the total facetectomy. So KDF. This is without facetectomy. So the concept is totally different, KDIF and TDIF. So if you insert the cage through the canvas triangle, it's not the TDIF anymore. It is KDIF. Today, I'd like to uh, introduce my machine. I invented the full endo KDIF system. This is very um, safer technique minimally invasive. This yellow line you can see here, using a 12 millimeter skin incision, you can use, uh, you can insert a big cage into the, in the body of this space. Okay, important thing is before starting this KDF, you should be a skillful transplantal for endosurgeons, like a dissectomy first. Okay, can, I'm, in my country, uh, we are doing uh, transplantal endoscopic dissectomy under the local anesthesia. This is a basic technique for endoscopic surgery for decompression or some plastic or anything. The, you should be a good surgeon for transplantal endoscopic. Okay, this is a plastic outside in technique. You can see here in if you your cannula is outside, you can see the bone here, SAP here. And this service is here. A uh, couple of times I visited uh, Tony Young in Arizona. Tony told me that uh, Bonnie is my friend and Bonnie is your friend. Always please look for the, the location of SAP. Bone is your friend. So I'm always looking for bones. So if I see the bone, I'm get very peace and very happy. Yeah, the one boy is my friend Koichi, Tony is told me. Oh, this gentleman is 32 years of medical doctor after after foraminotomy, the big ACA HNP fragment was removed. So this is foraminoplastic outside in. So important. You can see here this, this is before foraminotomy, this is after foraminotomy. If you come, if you make a foraminoplasty or foraminotomy, that you can go into the spinal canal without any damage of injecting the root. So I think you should be a good foraminoplastic surgeon before starting a cave. You are very good skill have uh, for the foraminoplasty. You can take it out this big fragment at 5S1. Here, this is a pelvic bone and this is a facet bone. The angle is limited right here, but if you perform the foraminotomy, you can see here, you can uh, you can be there taking out uh, disc material out. For well, another surgery, since she uh, she is a professional golf player, she returned to the golfing two months after surgery. So uh, next step is that uh, foraminotomy. Foraminotomy, always look for bone. Bone is your friend. And remove the facet uh, SAP. And after you remove the thick uh, ligament and frame, you can look, you can confirm the decomposed existing root. For example, <clears throat> he's a professional baseball player. Five years he has been having a right buttock pain. It is increasing year by year. Look at this, the right foramen is so tight. Uh, lady program and block. The nerve root is running right here. Something is pushing right here. This is SAP. SAP is pushing L5 nerve root right here. After uh, block, the pain is gone completely. So I recommend him to do a foramen Look at this, after foraminoplasty, nothing there. 
uh, the compressor is confirmed. And for the next season, he started pitching very well. Yeah, they are, I directly introduced my great, great mentors, Professor Tony Young, Phoenix, Arizona, and he is my boss, Akira Dezawa, professor in Tokyo. <coughs> this picture is taken uh, 2013 in Sapporo. Professor Dezawa was held Isthmus meeting. This is my great Okay, I can show you how to perform a KDF. First of all, I'd like, I'm, I'm using a factor and speed screw system to reduce the slippage first. If you reduce the slippage, for, uh, the foramen got bigger and wider. Okay, the step three is the lambda for lambda plastics. This is the most important part. Avoiding the, you know, existing language injuries. So you need to remove the facet for SAP to enlarge the safety triangle more and more. You see here, I'm confirming the size one, two, three, four. Now I confirm the length of the exposed of this surface. For drip, the head is three millimeters. So I say four drill heads. So this means 12 millimeter is opened up right here. This is the insertion point of the cage. The length is 12 millimeter. It's very safe. And exiting rub is right here. So you can use, you can insert the big cage through this angle here. Yeah. And after I inserted the uh, uh, Kirshner wire, I inserted the pencil dilator. And the disk space is now 8 millimeter. And I use, uh, uh, is I invented a safe guide wire. You can see here, ball shaped tip is there. Don't go to into the abdominal uh, space. I inserted the safe guide inside here. Maybe I'm touching the, uh, the other side, the other side of the other sclerosis. Okay, this is a cannula and this is safe S guide. Yeah, the tip is uh, round, not go in there. Using S guide, we can uh, insert this spacer. It, this is a 10 millimeter, this is 8 millimeter. Since the, uh, the height is now 8 millimeter, it is uh, usually uh, can go in without any damage of the, the root because the uh, surface of the disc is now 12 millimeter. So this is very safe insertion of this. Look at this. Yeah, I'm inserting a spacer. Height is eight and width is 10. Please look at this. Uh, please hear sound. Yeah, if I touch now the EMG monitoring, it give us a warning. Yeah, no one. The bus is, the bus is okay. Now is okay. Now the tip of the uh, camera uh, spacer uh, is inside of the bus. I inserted the uh, uh, spacer here. And after that, I rotate the spacer 90 degree. Then the height got 10 millimeter. 
from 8 million. Next step is to uh, insert this uh, open square neuron. Open side. There is open side. Yeah, open square angle. Yeah, this is a very important part. If this tiger touches a nerve, the EMG monitoring gives us a warning, warning sound. No warning. Now, um, Insert the camera inside the inside the case. No warning. Okay. Once again, no warning. No warning. Yeah, this is the warning. I think this is the vibration. Yeah, this is warning. Look at this, this is a spacer, and this line is a open cannula, and take out, this is a cannula. And now Bruce is uh, away from the uh, cannula. Next step is a curate of the disc tissue. Look at this, a uh, shaver, we can use a uh, positional shaver, not a specific one. We can use under uh, CM variance, we can shave and shave one side and the other side. Since this is uh, open, and uh, you can go um, wider space. Here, this is a C arm. You can see here the space. You can use this shaver cleaning up right here, right here, here using this uh, open color. Next is uh, bone grafting. Yeah, usually I use uh, allograft. We have a, a allograftic, allograftic bone in the university, but uh, if uh, the institution doesn't have a allograft, I'm taking, uh, I recommend to take a small amount of uh, autologous bone from a pelvic. Yeah. I made a special panel to insert the Last into the piece. Sometimes I'm using a hydroxyapatite mixture. Yeah, uh, now I'm using a rice expandable case. This is a really big one. Width is 10. And length is 23 to 29 millimeter, and height is 8 to 14. Look at this. Inside of open cannula, you cannot see the uh, case. This means really safe. You can go, you can insert this case right here and right here. Yeah. So open side is uh, facing to the bone. So no worry about nerve damage. Existing nerve is here, traversing the nerve is there, over the facet bone. So no nerve tissue is here. So you can go sliding into the expandable cage into that disc space. Yeah, you can see here, this cage is such a go further and further and further here. Yes, look at the skin incision. It's just a uh, 12, 12 millimeter. Yes, now I'm inserting the okay, cage right here and not here. Yeah, we have one in some something, but this is from a vibration. Since this is an expandable case, I uh, made the expansion right here. Uh, the before expansion, the height 
is uh, it's seven millimeter, and the eight millimeter means the height of the open cannula. The length is 30, 33, and it goes up to 9.4 millimeter in this patient. <coughs> yeah, he's rotating this handle. This is he's expanding. Yeah, if you feel very tight, this is a fixed. Don't do, don't do a lot. It may damage the on the plate. Okay. Now, fluendoscopic KDF is completed. And you can remove the instrument. Yeah. Because this skin is you know, it's very small. This is a case <coughs> that patient has a low back pain uh, due to type 1 modic. Operation was performed uh, for endoscopic KDF procedure. Look at this. The four pedicle screws inserted PPS and in intervertebral fusion is completed using a <coughs> full end KDF system. Percutaneous screw and percutaneous case. Okay, uh, the other topics is the other case case is 84 years old female, low back pain and left leg pain. The uh, leg pain is due to a uh, foraminal stenosis is here. So I did, uh, I decided to do a uh, fluoroscopic cave. This case previously received the decompression surgery here, right here. So I did a uh, cave <coughs> uh, surgery. You can see here, uh, cannula here, and if you insert that, uh, pencil dilator here, the disc space goes up to uh, 8 millimeter. Then you insert the uh, square spacer, go up to 10 millimeter again. Open square, cut. And after bone graft, uh, cage insertion is possible, then expand it right here. Review after cage insertion, uh, taking other instrument of concanum is also removed. Here, uh, this case before surgery and after surgery. The posterior orthostasis is completely reduced. I started uh, this surgery, when surgery, in 2018. <coughs> Total number is 29, 27 cases uh, of when the case surgery. And the earlier 13 cases, I didn't have my original system, so I rented uh, Dr. Nagahama's PET system, and I did 13 cases. After May 2020, I did uh, 14 cases using my forensoscopic KDF system. The clinical outcome is excellent and good because this is a fusion surgery. And uh, I it, uh, encountered two irritating nerve irritation. The, yeah, it's an irritation means uh, like a uh, sensory disturbance, not pa uh, palsy. It's like a uh, dysphagia, but uh, it improved. So using a PET system, the complication rate was 7.7% and KDF system also, we had one case of so 7.1 percent. Thank you so much. And finally, I'd like to uh, explain my city. Fukushima is very famous in the nature. We have uh, the, 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 this bridge. This bridge was built in 12, 12th century, almost 1,000 years ago, still working in great nature. And also, we had a beautiful ocean. Uh, you can, if you like uh, surfing, uh, like from my place to 
there just only 18 minutes. It's also a great Naruto ocean. So far, we had a, a one year fellow from Nepal and six months fellow from Vietnam and from Taiwan. So many, many fellows and I'm accepting. And I was supposed to have many uh, fellows last year, but uh, you know, the pandemic of the COVID-19, it is canceled. So after COVID-19, I will have uh, uh, some fellows from uh, many countries. So if you are uh, interested in my surgery, endoscopic surgery, endoscopic confusion surgery, please, call, uh, please give me a call. Please give me an email. And thank you very much. This is my final slide. I will be a Congress President of World Congress of Minimal Invasive Spine Surgical Technique it, uh, in Tokyo. And the, uh, the time is uh, November 24 and 25. If the COVID-19 is finished, please come to Japan. I welcome you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, you. Professor Sairo, and welcome back, audience. Um, if we would like to emphasize, if you have questions on the lecture for Professor Sairo, please don't hesitate to send us your questions in the YouTube chat box or send us an email at education at revospine.com. So I have, I have a, probably a question in between Professor Sairo. Um, I mean, you, you did a lot of uh, disc herniation endoscopic cases before. Um, yes. And what would you recommend when a surgeon should start with these uh, endoscopic fusion cases? Um, um, how many surgeries he should be done before for disc herniation, for stenosis or something like that, before he can start with fusion, endoscopic fusion cases? Is there any recommendation from your side for that? Mm, so far, I don't have the recommendation, but uh, I think at least 50 yeah. disc herniation case for transforaminal, transforaminal case, then uh, for a minotomy using a pearl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's important. For aminotomy is very important. If you have a good skill for aminotomy, you can go to a future. Maybe 50 disc herniation, 50 for aminoplasty. I think that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's a good good recommendation. I mean, mm -hmm. it's also important to to state that that everyone has to have or have to go through the learning curve with standard cases yeah. before starting so, that. Yeah, thank mm. you very much for thank sharing you. your experience <laughs> in the field of transforminal abroad at all, but of course also to show your step for your surgical steps for the full endoscopic caliph procedure. I think um, in the meantime, we received one question in the YouTube chat and um, <coughs> I would like to read the, the question um, from, from the surgeon here. He's asking Professor Syro, interesting presentation. How is the fusion rate with the metal cage? Do you have a, a number for that? Or? Yeah, so far I checked uh, uh, like about 90. Uh, so far I checked uh, one year results and the one case has a shoulder arthrosis. So, um, uh, so far, ninety percent because uh, I I uh, insert I insert, inserted a lot of bones inside mm -hmm. the disc. Uh -huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we we just would like to remind you whenever you have question, please send us your questions via the YouTube um, chat function, and uh, after the next presentation, we will do. Um, a final discussion with everyone. So uh, Professor Sairo will be available after the next lecture as well for our final discussion uh, in this uh, session. Now we are coming to our second lecture. And uh, yeah, we are now connected to Munich. We are flying back from, 
from Japan to Germany now, and we are now connected to Munich, and we say hello, Professor Christoph Siepe. Hello, can you hear us? Hello, I can hear you very well. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm very much looking forward to joining the session and sharing some experiences, and maybe later on, like you mentioned, we can have a nice discussion. Um, I'm sure there will be technical questions, how to better do this and that, and how to address certain problems. So yeah, I'm looking forward to joining this event. Thank you. Your topic today is full endoscopic decompression in spinal stenosis cases. Um, also one advanced indication uh, before we start probably, when did you start uh, with, with these stenosis cases, in, in with clinical cases? And uh, probably some recommendations, how many cases you should have done in a convention or in the endoscopic way for discarnations before you could start with these uh, stenosis cases. Yeah, I, I will get to that question during my talk. Okay, okay. great. So mm -hmm. my, my, my background is I've grown up with a microscope. So every, everything we do here, we do in a microscopic fashion. Yeah whether that may be in the cervical spine, uh, whether that was um, the, the over-the-top decompression or uh, surgeries for disc herniations. So I have really grown up using the microscope and we've done many, many thousands of surgeries doing, uh, uh, using the microscope for, for t lifts. also. I think there are a lot of advantages when you use the microscope because you get very good magnification of small structures, of the little epidural vessels. It's uh, better to protect against blood loss because very specifically you can calculate bleedings and so on. But for me, I have over the last 10 to 15 years, so that was also part of your question. I think I started with the endoscopic technique about 10 to 15 years ago. And I made this transition and in the beginning, I only started with very, very easy cases. I started with an with a interlaminar technique, not with a transdominal technique. I started with an interlaminar technique and there with the, the easiest indication is really a disc herniation at the level L5 S1 because you've got a very wide interlaminar window. You don't yet need to use the burr, so this is very easy. And I actually, I took my time and it took me quite a while to, to stay there at this level because my priority was to stay safe. And really only when I feel very comfortable, then I went on to the next step. So that, that was part of your question. I think the recommendation would be do your cases, whatever that may be. One surgeon feels safe after 30 cases, another one maybe 60, 70, whatever that may be for you. You know, the, those numbers don't help you when somebody else feels comfortable, but you don't. Yeah. yeah? So time, um, when you feel comfortable, you go to the next step uh, to L4 or 5, where you can start using the burr. Um, I will show you some videos on that. And then only later on, but really significantly later, only later on, I would recommend that you do your first over-the-top decompressions. Thank you very much for your valuable recommendations on the learning curve. I think that's um, also very important to know when starting with this technique. So, yeah, I think we are excited and we are looking forward to your lecture on the full endoscopic decompression in spinal stenosis. Okay, I'm sharing my screen now. I hope that you can see it. We can see it, excellent. Thank you. So this is where I work. It's a, it's a historic clinic uh, that has a history of over 100 years. And um, what we will be talking about today is the decompression of central spinal stenosis. So you can see these cases here, usually elderly, usually often multimorbid patients. So obviously it's of great value when we can manage to reduce the invasiveness um, of our procedures. I think we need to establish what we're talking about because sometimes there's somewhat of a confusion with respect to the terminology. So we're not talking about microendoscopic, we're not talking about any tubular systems or endoscopically assisted. That from my point of view is a totally different type of surgery. So what we are talking about here is full uh, endoscopic surgery. This is what it looks like. We're quite spoiled in Munich, nice 4K screen. So everybody in the operating room can really join the surgery, whether we have visitors or 
colleagues from the Department of Anesthesiology, the nurses, everybody can see well. And then we do our uh, surgeries, small six to seven millimeters incision. Then is projected to the screens. Um, and that's the way we can do surgeries. Somebody's got their microphone on there. Maybe we can mute that. Okay, so this is how we do the surgery. We we uh, we finish the surgery with just a small uh, single stitch suture. So this is really nice. I'll get back to that later because the the issue of wound healing problems or infections is almost zero. So you can virtually eliminate that that risk. When we talk about the decompression of spinal stenosis, this is what we want to remove: these structures, the hypertrophic yellow ligament and the hypertrophic aspects. Uh, of the facet joint. And this is why when you talk about the different types of procedures, I personally believe for an over the top decompression for central spinal stenosis, the transferaminal approach is not the right approach because as you can see here, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Can you see my pointer? You would have to remove the entire facet joint and then even then you wouldn't be able to go transdural almost to the other side. So um, for decompression of spinal stenosis, so over the top decompression, this is what we need to do. We need to use the interlaminar approach. So this is what we will be talking about now. The patient is positioned in a prone position. We open up the operating table, and this helps you to increase the access to the spinal canal. You can see that here. So the interlaminar window opens up a little bit. Then we mark the incision on the patient's skin surface. So we mark the midline. We do one AP shot in, uh, in, the, AP, uh, in the AP view here. This is where we do our skin incision. And then with the knife, we just go down right next to the spinous process. And then we go down and we incise and detach the fascia from uh, the spinous process so that later on then as you can see here with this instrument, we can go straight down and place our uh, uh, guiding instruments directly on the spine, actually on the facet joint. And then here, as you can feel here, what I'm doing is you can feel the ridge between the facet joint and the interlaminar window. You can feel this and then you can already feel that your position is right. And then you can confirm that with another uh, AP shot. And all these instruments, then you will place your uh, your endoscope. And so this is very nice because this part of the surgery uh, can be done quickly. You can actually do the entire access uh, to the spine in 30 seconds, and that is independent of the patient's weight, whether the patient is 50 kilos or 150 kilos. Once you have done that, everything is done under endoscopic visualization of, of, the, uh, of the anatomic structures. So I'm standing in this surgery on the right side, which means then the right side of this picture here, this is cranial. The left side of this picture is caudal. And now, first of all, you need to expose your anatomic landmarks. So you will have to remove the soft tissue immediately here you can see even the slightest, smallest vessels, so you can uh, use the bipolar to coagulate them. Then you will have to expose the bony structures. You can do the scissors to do that. Uh, we can see that in this next video. So this is then the facet joint here. Um, this is the interlaminar window coming later, so all of this needs to be removed, and you can see the lamina up here. So very important, you need to know always at all times where you are uh, at every single step of the surgery. So here you can use the sharp scissors to remove some of the joint capsule and some of the, uh, the structures that are still over, somewhat overlaying the interlaminar window. You can use the bipolar to shrink these structures because what's very important is you need to know your bony anatomic landmarks. And to the lateral side, that is the facet joint, and to the cranial side, that is the lamina. Once we have done that, especially for decompression of the spinal canal, you need to open up and widen your interlaminar window. And this needs to be done with a burr. 
So it's very important that you know how to use the bird. If you don't use the bird, because using this instrument uh, in, in the beginning of your learning curve is technically challenging. Um, so there are some tricks, for example, as you can see here in this video, the sleeve stays outside yeah, and the burr is a little bit deeper so that you can easily maneuver around. But this takes a little bit of time. If you, if you don't do this and you force your way into the spinal canal without using the burr at the level L45 or above, then you're running at a very high risk that you will injure uh, the neural structures. So you can see here using the burr when you do it properly is done very safely, very easily. It's all very easy gliding, sliding movements and somewhat rotating movements. And then you can open up your interlaminar window. Only once you have done that, and we can see that here in the next video, only once you have really thinned out the bone, then you will be able to use the Kevin's and punches that you can see here. There's a wide variety of, of carrots and punches, smaller ones, bigger ones, angled ones. So this one here uh, personally is my, my favorite. It's a little bit angled downwards, so it helps you to get underneath the facet joint also on the contralateral side. You can see here on this video that I'm doing quite a lot of the bony work whilst the yellow ligament is still in place, which means that you still have some, some kind of protection overlaying the, the neural structures. And then you do this basically like you would do this in a, in a, in a microscopic fashion. You go all the way cranially, uh, where you can see the insertion of the yellow ligament underneath the cranial lamina. And from there, you will start to detach the yellow ligament and you can basically put it downwards. And then you start to resect the yellow ligament. And you start to decompress the spinal canal centrally before later on you go laterally because it's always safer and easier to do your bites with the Kevin's and punches away from the dura as opposed to when you do your incision laterally and when you bite towards the dura you're always a little bit more running uh, a risk that you might catch a piece of the dura and and, and injure the dura so this is very important you can see here we started our decompression centrally and only then we go laterally uh, uh, towards the recess. So this is what we're doing now. Next step, recess decompression. You can see we've, we've decompressed, let's say 80% of the central spinal canal. And then you go layer by layer. You don't, don't just dig a hole in one a plane. You always go layer by layer so that you've got a very nice visualization of the new structures. Uh, these bits and pieces here, at around seven to eight o'clock, we still need to remove those because what is very, very important here in this part of the surgery is that you can see the exiting nerve root 100% and that you can make sure that caudally there is no more contact of ligament or of the bone with the exiting nerve root. So that's very important. And then you can see here slowly but surely we're able to mobilize the dura uh, over the over the disc, the disc will be coming in later. All of these structures here at six, seven, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, they still need to be removed. And you can kind of see in the left part of the video how we handle the instruments. It's always easy to handle the instruments, so never apply any force. When you have to apply force, then it's likely that you're doing something wrong. Okay, overview, central decompression of the spinal canal has been performed. Okay, caudally, we can now see the exiting nerve root. You can move, move around the neural structures. We're now going to the contralateral side. Here you can see the disc space. So in case there is an accompanying disc herniation, it's absolutely no problem whatsoever to remove any disc herniation or cranial or portal sequestering. Going to the contralateral side is actually easy because you only tilt the scope and then with a 25 degree angle optics, you're going to the contralateral side in the contralateral into the contralateral recess. And if you ask me <clears throat> if we compare the microscopic to the endoscopic technique, this part of the surgery in an, in an endoscopic fashion is actually almost faster. 
So doing the contralateral decompression is, is very quick. Yeah, you can use your, your carrying some punches, your scissors even, you can use the burrs if you have to extend the contralateral decompression. So the contralateral decompression is, is fairly uh, fast and easy, whereas on the ipsilateral side, there was a little bit more work to do with the burrs. So this maybe takes a little bit longer uh, on the ips ipsilateral side. So you can see here, uh, there's quite a bit of yellow uh, ligament compression which is what we will have to remove later. So as you can see here, we will insert our instruments. And then we do basically the same of what you would be doing uh, in the microscopic technique until all of the contralateral structures have been fully decompressed. OK, and you can confirm this towards the end of the surgery. You can make sure if you think that you have done a thorough decompression, if you think you need to remove a little bit more, then you can still use parents and punches, or if you like, you can use uh, the burrs, which are immediately protected so that you don't injure. There's an exiting nerve root here. Um, so there's a very good visualization here so that you can make sure that everything has been fully decompressed. I'm fast forwarding this a little bit. So this is the ipsilateral side. You can see there is no more compression. The contralateral side, all of this, the yellow ligament that was here before has been fully removed. And here you can see with the bipolar, I'm using this uh, also to, to palpate. You can see that there is no more compression here, no more compression from the disc either. And then you know that you've done a, a good job and that you can finish your surgery. From a technical point of view, I would recommend for this particular type of surgery that you use the largest scope, which is this right endoscope here, which has a 5.5 millimeter working channel, simply because you can use a burrs that are a little bit bigger. Yeah, it's if you think only 1.5 millimeter bigger than the four millimeter working channel. But this will make a big difference for you because the instruments are bigger, the cannons and punches are bigger. And there's actually a lot of uh, material that needs to be removed from the hypertrophic yellow ligament, from the bone. You can use wider burrs. So using this biggest scope, which is particularly designed for the decompression of, uh, of a spinal canal stenosis, it will make the surgery for you easier and also faster. Next thing that is important is I would really recommend start with this over the top decompression only later on in your learning curve. And obviously when you start, you start with the easy cases and the easy cases are the ones usually where you have uh, the majority of the stenosis coming from hypertrophic yellow ligament. So these cases, generally speaking, uh, are a little bit easier to start with. So what are the indications for full endoscopic surgery? Basically, as you can see here, there's a literature review. You can treat all kinds of pathologies that basically you can also treat with a microscope. You can address disc herniations, sequestrated disc herniations, medial lateral, cranial, caudal sequestrations. Uh, you can uh, uh, remove synovial facet joint cysts. So overall, if you look at the indications that are possible with full endoscopic technique, the technique as such, there is no limit. You have punches, you have bipolars, you have burrs. The limit is the surgeon or whatever you feel, what you feel comfortable with at your individual stage of the learning curve. So if you are very, uh, if, if, you, if you're starting with this technique and you're a total beginner, then this only limits yourself to doing easy discectomies at the level of five as one. And then step by step, you will see that surgeries that previously you've been doing with a microscope, you will start to do them with the endoscope. And for me, I'm almost doing virtually everything uh, nowadays uh, in an endoscopic uh, technique when you feel comfortable, but you need to take your time and it's going to take maybe a few years. Just to show you some, some technical results, this was a case of a spinal stenosis decompression. And we did an MRI 48 hours after the surgery. So you can see that uh, that here you can achieve nice uh, and full decompressions of the spinal canal. 
and this is the material that we that we uh, that we were able to remove during the surgery. So, with respect to the post-operative regime, patients can be mobilized immediately after the surgery, or let's say as soon as the anesthesia wears off, so that it allows you for a safe mobilization. Uh, there is no need for a brace. The patients can be discharged from the clinic two days after the surgery, and there is no medical reason for that. You would actually be able, from my point of view, to do this on an outpatient basis. But the reason for this here in Germany is our DRG system, where if you discharge the patient earlier than two days after the surgery, then uh, we will be deducted quite a relevant amount of the, of the reimbursement, and that's why the patients have to stay for two days, which is kind of paradox, but that's the way that it is here still today at this stage, and I'm hoping that this will change over time. There are some real big advantages from my point of view when you switch over to performing your surgeries uh, in a full endoscopic technique. And one of them is when you have obese patients or very strong, for example, athletic patients. And that is because this technique is virtually independent of the patient's weight. It doesn't really make a difference if you have a patient that's 50 kilos or 150 kilos, you still do the same small six, seven, eight millimeter incision, but it doesn't really influence that much uh, your surgery in the spinal canal. So this is very nice and very elegant when you can do a surgery in an obese patient with only a small skin incision. As you can, for example, see here in this lady, that was a case of a two level over the top decompression, L3 to L5, and this lady had 140 kilograms of body weight with a BMI of 48. And we know that if you do this in an open technique or a microsurgical technique, sometimes this can become very uncomfortable and challenging simply it's because it's so deep to even reach the spine before you can start your surgery. There is another case of a three level over the top decompression that I performed or one case of a even four level over the top decompression L2 to S1. Obviously, it doesn't make sense if you're at the beginning of your learning curve and it takes you two hours for a single decompression, then doing a four-level decompression would take you way too long. So same thing again, when you feel comfortable and you're becoming faster with the technique, then you can also address uh, multi-level cases. And this is a nice post-operative image that the patient sent to me six weeks after the surgery. So you can see that this, is, this has healed uh, nicely. And one other issue that I already addressed uh, in, in the introductory part of my presentation is that with a, with a full endoscopic technique, you can almost eliminate, eliminate the risk of infection or wound healing problems. This is a picture that I have taken uh, in a case that was under the microsurgical technique. And the risk, I think, is if you make your incisions too small, you insert the retractor, and you put too much pressure onto the skin, then the surrounding skin is already predisposed uh, of developing wound healing problems. We do not see this with an endoscopic technique because there's never any pressure on the skin. The skin incision is very, very small, only six to seven millimeters. We use a lot of sterile saline solution during the surgery. So, I mean, there's never a 0% risk uh, in medicine, but this is with an endoscopic technique with respect to infection or wound healing problems as close to 0% as you can possibly get. There is a learning curve, that's right, and that's why we should do this technique. We should try and learn this slowly and carefully, and patient safety is absolutely paramount. But I think what we should also establish is we should establish what is the best technique out there. And once we have established what is the best technique, then we as surgeons should try to learn that technique. You can take time and there may be some gradual shifting. Let's say you start with a microscope 100% and then the microscope becomes 90% and you're doing 10% of your surgeries endoscopically. And over time, you can see that there will be somewhat of a transition. But I think what is important is you need to make a conscious decision. What is the best technique for what particular case? And if you think that that is the best technique, then I think it's really 
uh, valid that you're trying to do this learning curve uh, for yourself. So, as I mentioned, it needs time to grow. Please do not try to learn this technique and try now to do every surgery in 15 to 20 minutes. It will not work. In the beginning, you will probably take longer, of course, than when you compare your operating time to, let's say, the microscope where you've done 4,000, 5,000 cases already. Obviously, you're faster with the old technique and maybe more comfortable in the beginning. So you need time to learn this. And over time, when you know, when you feel comfortable with the, with the endoscope, then you'll become better and faster, but it really needs time to grow. So just like I pointed out with the interlaminar technique, start with easy discectomies, L5 is one. Then you can do easy discectomies, L4, five, where you can start to learn how to use the burr. As I mentioned, this is technically a little bit more advanced than you can do in the next step the first lateral recess decompressions, and then later on, much later on, you can do the over-the-top over decompressions that I showed you here today. And then very much in the end, what I personally think is one of the most elegant techniques is the one of full endoscopic posture cervical foraminotomies. Very elegant, but I would keep that uh, for your last stage of the learning curve. From my own point of view, I think that if we look at the advantages that MIS surgery has brought about from going from open surgical techniques uh, with laminectomies, going to the microscope, for me personally, going to the endoscope is only the next logical step in the evolution of the surgical procedures and the patients definitely benefit from another reduction uh, of the invasiveness of our surgeries, whether that may be an 80 or 90 year old patient that you treat for, for uh, decompression of spinal stenosis, or if you have a young 20 year old athlete, all patients benefit from the reduction of invasiveness uh, of the surgeries. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you for joining this online uh, webinar here today. Thank you very much, Professor Siepe, and welcome back, audience, to our today's expert session. Um, I would like to emphasize, if you have questions now for our faculty, Professor Syro or Professor Siepe, please don't hesitate to type in your question in the YouTube chat, and we can discuss it now live with the faculty. So we are very pleased to have two very, really experienced spine surgeons here with us today. So thank you very much for, for joining. And um, I would like to, uh, to address one question to Professor Siepe. Um, maybe for our audience who does not have um, experience in full endoscopic surgery yet, uh, in your video, in your nice demonstration of the cases, we saw that the, the picture is really uh, very beautiful. We can see the structures very well. Is it always like that? Or how is the situation with bleedings? Can it, it's sometimes the, the picture disturbed by bleeding or how can we manage that? The, the bleedings can be, you're absolutely right. So obviously I chose nice uh, uh, videos here for demonstration purposes. The bleedings can be an issue to a point where it gets somewhat irritating um, and they can really impair the, the vision. And then first of all, because before you continue with your surgery, you need to make sure that you coagulate these bleedings. And now um, you have to, you have to see are the bleedings coming from epidural vessels, which usually is fairly easy because you know where the bleeding is coming from. You go straight there with a bipolar uh, and then you coagulate those, those bleedings directly and that will solve your, your problems. Um, sometimes the bleedings from the bone, especially when you use the burr, they can be a little bit more challenging. You can also use the bipolar to go directly to uh, to the bone, and then you slightly increase the um, the the intensity of the electricity, and you can try to use the bipolar there. Or what you can do is you can go there, you can go back with a burr, maybe even a diamond burr, and then you can uh, use the burr directly on that bleeding, and that usually also uh, helps you to solve these problems. 
Okay, thank you very much for your recommendations and tips. Yes, we have another question uh, for Dr. Zairo um, uh, regarding the protection of the exiting nerve root. Are there some tricks for this protection of the exiting nerve roots while the cage insertion and while uh, foraminotomy? Do you have some recommendations for that? Yeah, one thing, uh, I'm always using uh, neuro monitoring. Ah. Mm -hmm. it's a, you know, it's an EMG warning. If I touch the nerve root, the muscle, you know, happy, so the warning. So, first of all, I insert a uh, cannula outside and making a uh, foraminotomy, wider, 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 bigger and bigger. And if the disc space is over 12 millimeter, no, no more exiting numbers anymore. Ah. So, hmm. foraminotomy is very important. After uh, making foraminotomy uh, uh, as good, you know, 12 millimeter, uh, now it's away from the space. Yeah. And so the most important thing is not protection, making a space using a foraminotomy. Yeah. Of course, in the, uh, my uh, cannula, the nerve is protected. But the important, important thing is you should make the space by yourself. Yeah. Safe yeah. space. And you can, you, you can see that and control that very well during the surgery. When do you decide that the foraminotomy is done sufficiently? And yeah, uh, I think, uh, yeah. the bar, the bar, mm -hmm. bar is uh, three millimeter. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. One, two, three, four. This means twelve millimeter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank okay. you very much. Very nice tip. Then yeah. um, maybe let's uh, stay on that topic with uh, Professor Sairo. There is another question from Indonesia. Um, hello, Professor Sairo. Do you do full endoscopic calif under local anesthesia? How do you do uh, that in your practice, Professor? It's, uh, yeah, I read the literature. In some countries, uh, someone doing that under the local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's possible. It's possible because uh, I'm doing a transforminal approach, everything under the local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So if only just inside the cage, I've never performed, but uh, I think I can. But uh, PPS, pap tennis endoscope, uh, not the pap tennis pedicle screw insertion, you, you know, we need a lot of amount of uh, local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So, so far, I do not recommend under the local anesthesia. I do under the general anesthesia. Do you. Dr. Sairo, I have, a, I have a request to you. So if, if you do that surgery on me, mm -hmm. I would prefer that you don't do it under local. I would prefer to sleep. <laughs> yeah. <I see>. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, a lot, there's a lot of working on the bone, you're in contact with the nerve that might be really uncomfortable. Um, so I see the point of trying to assess where can we do what procedures just under local anesthetic, but I think some of the procedures might be really uncomfortable for the patient and maybe better to just have a, to, uh, short sleep and wake up and the surgery is done. I think much, much more comfortable. Yeah, one, this is a very good uh, question and request. In my country, a lot of patients is over 85, 90. Uh. And general condition is bad. Mm -hmm. Lung, lung problem and heart mm -hmm. problems. So many elderly patients is no more general anesthesia mm -hmm. by the anesthesiologist. So I, for such patient, I should, I must perform a surgery under the local anesthesia. So I'm doing some surgeries under the local because must. Mm -hmm. huh. Because anesthesiologist mm -hmm. says no more generals. Okay. If the patient is allowed to have a general, yeah, it's okay. Mm -hmm. Do interlaminar using uh, under the general anesthesia. But, uh, in, you know, my baby JAMA is going to every country, mm -hmm. but in Japan, mm -hmm. a lot of like over 90 years old age needs a surgery. For such population, I do uh, surgery under the local anesthesia. 
Yeah, okay. So, Professor Siepe, it means in your daily practice you do in general uh, general anesthesia for full endoscopic surgery? We do all surgeries under general anesthesia. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we okay. don't use any more muscle relaxation, so only once for the, uh, for the intubation. Mm -hmm. But after that, there is no more, uh, we don't administer any more muscle relaxants. So if you work with the nerves, and you, then you would have a motory response if there was anything. Um, but otherwise, we do all surgeries, general anesthesia. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We, we have another question to Professor Cyro for the Caliph procedure uh, regarding the bone graft. I, I guess you mentioned that during the uh, uh, during your presentation that you are that you are using sometimes allografts and sometimes autografts. Yes. How often are you using uh, allografts and uh, and which kind of autograft you use when when uh, you do the surgery? Uh, I'm doing a, a surgery in the three hospitals. Mm -hmm. In university mm -hmm. hospital, I can use allograft. Mm -hmm. So I use mm -hmm. allograft. But the other two hospitals, no allograft is available. Mm -hmm. So for such hospital, uh, there is a small skin incision for percutaneous pedicle screw. Using the small skin incision, I put a, a, like a trefan, mm -hmm. trefan, mm -hmm. then get the uh, autologous bone from a pelvic. Mm -hmm. ah. From the and, pelvic. And the mixture. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay, you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Then uh, let's uh, move to another question for Dr. Siepe. Uh, there's a question, are there cases where you would restrict the patient's activities longer than 10 days to prevent discarniation recurrence, as in large analyst defects or obese patients? Absolutely. So if, um, if we have a patient with a decompression where you do not touch the disc, then from my point of view, you just wait for, for the period of wound healing, let's say seven to 10 days time. And after that, from my point of view, they can do anything they like. Yeah, they can mobilize very quickly. It's a different story when you have a patient with a disc herniation. And so if we only do a sequestrectomy and we do not have to touch the disc, then those patients, they can also mobilize very quickly. If they have a very large annular defect and still a very high disc space, then that means there is a considerable risk of recurrent disc herniations. And I think those patients, we really have to slow down. You can argue whether it makes sense to give them a brace or not, but in any case, I would definitely recommend to them to take it easy over the first, let's say, six to eight weeks even, um, with extreme movements, bending forward, just to reduce the risk of recurrence. And the patients need to know that. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have one more question regarding, yeah, probably it's a question for, for both of you. Uh, regarding the bone resection, when you resect bone with a burr, sometimes uh, you, you get sharp edges of the bone there. Is there a risk that you can get a nerve injury uh, by uh, sharp resection edges of the bone? Probably we start with Professor Siepe with, for the interlaminar and then... Well, yes. if you see it, I mean, the. The, the question already implies the answer. If you can see a sharp edge of the bone, yeah. you need yeah. to remove it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, because there, there, there are cases where there is no, we all know these cases, there's no dura lesion um, during the <clears> surgery, <throat> but then maybe two or three or four weeks later, there are first symptoms of CS, CSF leakage. And, and then when you do the revision case, sometimes you see these sharp edges. So, of course, whenever you see something like that, then try to smoothen it, go back with a burr, or um, um, go back with, with one of the Kerens and punches. You take away that edge, and then um, and then you can solve that, that problem easily. Okay. Professor Seiro, for, for transferminal, okay. especially when you do the foraminotomy, um, in, in probably in the higher part of the foramen, 
uh, is there a, yeah, a, a chance or do you have some recommendations to avoid sharp edges of the bone or do you see a risk there that you can cut or injure the, uh, the nerve, the exiting nerve? Uh, I don't think so. It's, uh, yeah. I, I do uh, la laminate, partial laminectomy and ventral facetectomy using a transplanar approach. Uh -huh. um, the exiting nerve is far away from the bone mm -hmm. uh, after removing the uh, superior articular process. So, so no more bone anymore. But uh, for the traversing nerve, after a ventral facetectomy or laminectomy, transplanar approach, yes, bone still sometimes there. But uh, yes, you should remove the sharp edge using the, mm -hmm. we have a special Edison from Joe and the diamond bar. It smooth it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I would like to move to the next question also for Professor Syro. I think a very interesting question from uh, India, probably. Mm -hmm. Professor Syro, are we able to remove disc adequately during endoscopic fusion? There's often a debate that for a better bony fusion, the disc needs to be removed completely and uh, we need a good end plate preparation. Yeah, that, that's a great, great question. Uh, uh, before I use, I embedded the open cannula. Mm -hmm. I was using a, a round shaped cannula. It's a limit, the shape, the motion of the shaver is very limited. Mm -hmm. But after I embedded open cannula, you know, the motion is a lot. So we can shave, shave and maybe a lot of uh, space into the disc. So. Now I'm not worrying about uh, uh, such small amount of the curates. I do a lot of amount of the curate. Uh, after that, I put endoscope into the disc space and confirm that the disc is almost out. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mm. Yeah, then uh, we see, I think we... Yeah, we, we have a, another question for Professor Siepe. Uh, central stenosis is sometimes accompanied by an advanced facet arthrosis, resulting in instability. Could decompression over the top worsen this instability? Can you maybe repeat the last part of that question? Can you? Uh, uh, um, sometimes could decompression over the top the deco over the top decompression worsen the instability I mean it's always a question worsen, worsen. Yeah. yes worsen yeah. yeah it can if you remove too much uh, of the facet joints yeah which are an integral part of the um, of the stability yeah then the decompression may become worse so it's really um, a case by case decision. Yeah. Do you think that you can still address this problem adequately only in a minimally invasive technique? Uh -huh. That could be microscopic, that could be endoscopic, or is the instability already has it so far progressed that the stability has become more of a problem and you need to stabilize on top? Okay. So this is a question that you need to make before the surgery. And uh, and I think yeah that's that that's very important. And then if you think that you can still address the problem minimally invasive, then you have the options of using a microscope uh, or the endoscope. Yeah. Did you ever have? You see, it? when you do a decompression like you saw here, yeah, you only remove so much of the facet joint until you can see that the lateral border of the dura in the recess is fully decompressed. You don't remove more only so much, only basically what's too much of a facet joint. So let's say uh, with a generation, the facet joint has now 120%, you remove it back to 100%, just so that you can see the lateral border of the, dural, uh, of the neural structures clearly with no more compression, but no more. Did you, did you ever had a, a case during your daily uh, practice when, the, when during the surgery you decided to to uh, to switch over to a fusion surgery? Um, no, no, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a good thing to do. Yeah, and um, it's it's always very clear 
before the surgery, you need to make your decision. Mm. And uh, you can't tell uh, the patient that you're doing a small endoscopic procedure with a seven millimeter incision. And then after the surgery, the patient wakes up with four screws. And mm. you know, this decision is clear before the surgery. Then if the result is not what is expected, these things can happen. And then maybe later on, a few weeks or months after the surgery, if the result is not what you expected, well, then you can go back and discuss with the patient, well, I think we, we, we do need to do more, but uh, not in the primary surgery. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think we're coming to an end of our session. Uh, there are at least for the moment no more questions in the chat. But of course, I would like to emphasize to the audience, if you would like to learn more about full endoscopic surgery, maybe you would like to start or you have um, questions on that, please don't hesitate to contact us at education at rebospine.com. But for today, I would like to express really our sincere thanks to Professor Syro and to Professor Siepe for joining that session today. It uh, was really both two excellent presentations and demonstrations with really very interesting and valuable um, tips and tricks and um, exciting topics. So thank you very much. And also thank you very much to all participants. We had a lot of participants from all over the world today. And thank you for joining this session. So I would like to emphasize if you would like to keep up to date on the topic all around full endoscopic spine surgery, please visit our YouTube channel or also have a look on our website www.rebospine.com. You will find always the updated programs and activities as online or as uh, physical um, meetings or trainings online. So for now, we wish you all the best. Thank you very, very much for joining. And please stay safe, stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.